If our small daily actions can add up to such big damage, then changing what we do in small, easy ways can and will take the planet in a positive direction. That's the kind of thinking it'll take to reverse another kind of pollution that's plaguing our seas and waterways. You want a clue? For a young albatross, the first year of life is full of waiting. Waiting for parents to bring back food. Waiting to grow big and strong enough to wander the seas and fend for themselves. But lately, for growing numbers of chicks, those moments never arrive. You see skeletons, and in the middle of a chick, their stomach is full of all sorts of plastic. The first thing you think of is, how, there's no food in here. There's no room for food. To Michelle Hester and her colleague, Hannah Nevins, what you can find inside a seabird is as startling as it is disturbing. White Look at that. Pacifier. Lots of fishing line. And then there's also what we call industrial plastic, which are the pellets that start the whole process. If you want to make a toy soldier, you'll order pellets. And those look almost exactly like fish eggs which is why albatross parents scoop them up and bring them home to feed their young. For the chicks, it's an unhappy meal. If their stomach is full of plastic, then it's displacing water, so they might be dying of dehydration. Or it's just malnutrition. It's just simply that they can't get enough food and nutrients. What is shocking to me is that these very experienced albatross parents, they can live 60 years plus, are repeatedly recognizing plastic as a source of food. The mystery is that these birds don't feed on the island. So where is all this plastic coming from? It's exactly that question that Charles Moore was prompted to ask on a voyage across the Pacific. The journey changed his life. Ordinarily, sailors steer clear of the region they call the North Pacific Gyre. Bounded by a massive system of clockwise currents, it sits under a near permanent high pressure system. It took us a week to cross that area. And during the voyage, I came out on deck on a regular basis, surveyed the horizon, and was surprised that every time I saw trash. Halfway between Hawaii and the mainland, Moore had motored into the middle of a twice Texas sized collection zone for floating debris. Circulating winds draw the debris from around the Pacific Rim, and they bring it into the center, so you get a toilet bowl effect, but there's no exit. The material there may be there uh, since the dawn of the plastic era. This gyre is an enormous area, and if that's as contaminated as the part that I crossed, then we've got a huge problem. After consulting with scientists, he returns to measure systematically the volume of plastic in this stretch of ocean. Moore drags through the sea a fine mesh trawl net, the kind scientists use to collect plankton. And when we deployed that net and retrieved it, Very good. and Looking saw good. the soup of plastic that was in there, it was a complete shock. It turned out there was less plankton than plastic. The ocean had become a plastic soup. These pieces never go away. When Charles Moore's reports of all the trash in the gyre reached Michelle Hester and her colleagues, something clicked. They had been satellite tracking albatrosses, so now they could start to relate the flight paths to plastic littered patches of ocean. Of the birds that we tagged, indeed 70% of them actually went through the garbage patch region. Each of us now produce more than 1,500 pounds of trash a year, and the fraction that's plastic is going nowhere but up. If enough of us change what we do in simple ways, we can reduce the threat plastic poses to the ocean. Still, when it comes to plastic, out of sight shouldn't mean out of mind. Fred Vomsahl of the University of Missouri and Don Tillett of the US Geological Survey live and work in the nation's heartland. Alarmed by rising numbers of wild animals found with bizarre developmental and reproductive problems, They've joined a national effort to find the cause. The prime suspects include pesticides, 
the residue of birth control pills and other drugs in treated wastewater, and a compound found in many familiar plastics, bisphenol A. The problem with chemicals such as bisphenol A is it breaks out of the plastic and leaches into water. Studies show that from water, this chemical can get into animals. And there it can act like a dose of the female sex hormone, estrogen. Too much estrogen can disrupt the endocrine system, and that's been linked to a wide range of health impacts, including gender bending. One critical unanswered question is at what level of exposure these effects occur. With bisphenol A, we're talking about extremely small quantities of this chemical getting into the environment. Samples drawn from this stream had only 30 parts per trillion. Vamsal is worried because studies show tiny amounts of bisphenol A can derail early cell development in mice. And if mice are vulnerable, might people be as well? Recently, Vamsal tested clear plastic baby bottles to see if they release bisphenol A. He devised the simplest of experiments. Let distilled water sit in brand new bottles for 24 hours and then test it. Every one released bisphenol A. Curious, he then decided to see what happens when the same baby bottles are run through an ordinary dishwasher, which heats them to 140 degrees. Some of these bottles, by the time we had washed them 10 times, were leaching 10 times more bisphenol A than they had before they had been washed. The plastics industry vigorously disputes any danger to children from the chemical. They cite the continued blessing of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. But the Japanese are cutting back in their use of bisphenol A, and recent independent studies have motivated the FDA to take a fresh look. <laughs> 